morning scripture comes from a letter from Paul to the church in Corinth where he hopes to address divisions that are occurring there. It's scriptures 1, um, it's um, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 31. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. I know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of gifts. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear were to say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in, in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a singular member, where would that body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. So I found something the other day at my parents' house. Something that I literally hadn't seen in 20 years. It was from 1999, 20 years ago this spring. It was a videotape. Now, for you uh, young kids who don't know what a videotape is, a videotape is a thing about that big, looks like a brick, has some magnetic tape on the inside, and on that tape is videos. I know it's not, you know, it's kind of ancient technology by this point, but I found this videotape, and on that tape was the video from the first sermon that I ever gave at my home church when I was a senior in high school. Now, I've told this story occasionally, uh, but if you haven't heard it before, uh, I'll, I'll recount it again a little bit. And I bring it up today because there's a pretty deep connection between this story in my life and the scripture for today. 
Essentially what happened was in the months before that sermon, I kind of had an experience of God calling me to give that sermon. And it was a little bit like uh, Samuel, the, the boy Samuel in the Old Testament being woken up in the middle of the night by the voice of God. I, I was woken up in the middle of the night and I had these images, these bits and pieces of a message and along, that wouldn't go away until I wrote them down. And along with that, I had this strong sense that I needed to give these as a sermon to my home church, which had like, you know, 350 people in it. And high schoolers don't exactly ask to give sermons at this place. In any case, I, I had this feeling in the middle of the night. And so I, one day after church, I went up to my pastor and I said, well, I um, <clears throat> kind of think m maybe I would like to uh, give a sermon. <clears throat> and he said, that would be great. I'll help you do it. And so we spent a couple of months working on the sermon. And then one day, I stood up in front of a congregation and started speaking. And yes, since you're curious, I was able to put that video into the computer. And if you would like to see a little bit of baby Alan beginning that sermon, <laughs> here you go. Today, I'm going to ask you to take a fresh look at some of the events throughout the Bible. Everybody has read them, and they have a tendency to become second nature. Today, I'm asking you to think. I want you to really think and imagine. I want you to put yourselves inside these stories. Visualize what it's like to be there and experience these events. Imagine these stories in their full magnitude. Don't just listen to, but see and visualize the truly awesome power of God. The reason that I'm asking you to take a fresh look is that just recently, I have begun to take a fresh look at some of the scriptures in depth through catechism and other readings. This morning I would like to share with you some of the events that I have felt most moved by on my faith journey. Aww. <laughs> Baby Alan standing up there in his dad's suit and tie. <laughs> now, giving that sermon was significant. And the pastor's help before that was incredibly significant as well. But in that story of that morning, the most important part that changed the trajectory of my life happened after the sermon. It happened after the whole service, in fact. While I was standing out in the lobby shaking hands. And I'll tell you what that was in just a little bit. But first, we need to talk about the scripture for this morning. The scripture that we have for today is one of those scriptures that you may have heard before when people talk about spiritual gifts. But in reality, it's important to understand what came before and after this particular scripture. Let's remember here that this book of the Bible is a letter. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul to this fledgling church in the city of Corinth. It was a church that I, I think he helped plant and, and he really nurtured along the way. And it was a church that was really still just getting going when people didn't even really know what church was. And this church is definitely doing some things right. At the beginning of the letter, Paul starts off by giving them some affirmation and some praise by saying, I give thanks to my God always because of you, because of the grace of God that has been given you by the by Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched by him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the beginning of the letter. But then the next paragraph, things start to get a little interesting, and we see where Paul is heading with this. In the next paragraph, right at the beginning of the letter, Paul tells them that he does not want them to have any divisions among them. And he wants them to be united in Christ. And he says that he wants this for them because he has heard from Chloe's people. This is one of Paul's associates. But he's heard from Chloe's people that actually this church is dividing themselves and aligning themselves with different teachers or evangelists or apostles who have come through to teach them. People saying, well, I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Paul, or, or someone else. Right at the beginning of this letter, we see that this church is fractured and divided. But it's later in the letter that we start to see really how bad things have gotten, and how nasty 
and distorted things have gotten in this church. Our scripture comes from chapter 12, but in chapter 11, we see Paul giving a stern rebuke of them regarding how they are celebrating communion, or what he calls the Lord's Supper. Now, let me take one step back first and explain something about early Christian worship. Early Christian worship, uh, Christianity in general, actually took a bunch of stuff that existed in the wider culture, particularly the Greek and Roman culture, and sort of redefined it in order to worship Jesus. They did this with a bunch of ideas or even words uh, that were originally used in worshiping Caesar, but then they used them to worship Jesus instead. And interestingly, they kind of did this with the first version of early Christian worship. The earliest form of Christian worship was actually based on the Greek symposium, which were these gatherings that were held in people's homes that involved different people sharing uh, a poem or a story or a song or philosophy or, or something else. And most importantly, they shared a meal together. Now, one of the key features in the wider society and in these Greek symposiums was that society was divided into hierarchies. And the higher, you are, higher up you got, the better treatment you got. People were treated differently depending on their status or their wealth or whatever it was. So what you had is, at these symposiums, the rich and powerful people, they would get these nice comfy chairs right in the middle of the room, and they would get to eat the best food, and they would eat first before everybody else, while all of the poorer and lower class people would have to stand around the edges at the back, and maybe they would get something to eat. Now, early Christian worship gatherings were based on this kind of format. They, would, they were gathering in people's homes. They would share a full meal rather than just a symbolic meal like we often do. Um, but they would share a full meal and they would have somebody sing a song, another person bring a poem or, or a prophecy or a spiritual insight or something like that. They, they had a very similar kind of feel. But there was one major difference. One thing that set the church apart from everything else which was that in the church, everybody was treated the same. Everyone was equal. Everyone was cared for, no matter if you were rich or poor, male or female, free or slave, Jew or Greek, anything else. Everyone was supposed to be the same in the church. Except this church in Corinth was not doing that. The people in this church had started to slip back into the old ways of doing things. And quite frankly, <clears throat> Paul is having none of it. In chapter 11, Paul tears into them about how they have been behaving during the Lord's Supper. In chapter 11, Paul says, Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because, you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it, be become, will it become clear who is genuine among you. When you come together, it's not really the Lord's Supper that you eat, even though you say it is. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? No. In this matter, I do not commend you. At which point, Paul gives the wording and <clears throat> wording for the, the communion service and the Lord's Supper that we often would uh, recognize and use in our services. But then after that, he goes on to say, Whoever therefore eats, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat, the, eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And just a little bit later, he finishes by saying, So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. I mean, not only is the church in Corinth dividing themselves into factions aligned with different leaders, but they've also gotten themselves into this situation where they think that some people thought that they were better Christians than others. 
And they thought that they should be treated better or differently because they had more money or they were more important or did this or did that. I mean, it's not like Christians would do that today. <laughs> but for sure in the church in Corinth, it was a big deal. It was a bad situation. So that's the backdrop for our scripture. It's with that in mind that Paul then writes our scripture about spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. We see Paul telling them that they have all been given, all been given spiritual gifts by God. And that none of those gifts are really any more important than others. And that they are all needed. He compares their gifts and the people themselves to a body. He says that a body has all these different parts and they all have their jobs and they're all different. And without each of those parts doing its job, it can't function. The body isn't healthy. In fact, Paul even goes a bit harder on these divisions and says that what they have been doing is treating the people that they think are less than or are less honorable or different. They've treated them with less respect and honor. But actually, Paul says, in a physical body, we actually treat the parts that we think are less honorable with more honor and respect, clothing them in special ways. And so we should be doing the same thing in the church. They need to be lifting up the people that the rest of the world think should be standing in the back of the room. Those are the people that should be included up front, sharing the meal with everyone else with honor and dignity. Paul is writing this to a divided group of people who are, sent, who are essentially disrespecting each other. And he reminds them that in the church, at least, they're all equal, that they are all unique, but that they are all needed that they all have something to contribute, that they are all valued. And they need to recognize it and remember it. Paul actually helps this divided church do something that I think is critical for us as well. The problem is that people have become self-centered, thinking they're more important or gifted than others. Now, he could have done a couple of different things to remedy this imbalance. On one hand, he could have really taken these people who are all full of themselves and really taken them down a notch, at least even more so than he does, to equalize everybody else. But if you notice, that's not really what he's doing here. Instead, Paul is calling them to pay attention to the giftedness of each other. Paul lifts everyone else up in the congregation and helps them see how the Spirit of God is at work within everyone. And that everyone is a needed part of the body. That's an important task of recognizing and seeing how God is at work in each other. And it's that task of recognizing and naming the gifts of each other that's still essential for us today. It's also the thing that is the most essential part of the story about that first sermon that I gave. Yes, the preparation for the sermon and the sermon itself and the calling, all of that were important. But the most important part of that story for me <clears throat> was as, came as I was standing out in the foyer after the service. And there were all kinds of people coming up to me and saying, oh, you did such a great job, which they were happy that anybody under 30 was doing anything. And so most of the people I kind of blew off. But there were these two older adults who were my grandparents' age. And they came up to me and they said, no, Alan, pay attention to this. There's something going on here. God's doing something in you and this is important. And that's what caught my attention. It was that affirmation, that recognition of what God was doing in me and through me that changed the course of my life and set me on a course into ministry that brought me here today. It's that act of recognizing and naming the gifts that we see in each other that is an essential part of what it means to be the church today. And so today, 
I'd like us to take a little bit of time to actually do this. I'd like us to break up into some small groups as we close the sermon. And if you can, you know, get four or five people, but if you can, uh, try and get a kid in your group. Because <clears throat> that intergenerational part of this is really important. So stand up and move around if you have to. But when you get into these groups, I'd like you to take a little bit of time, and I know this may feel a little weird or uncomfortable, but I would like you to simply name some of the things that you appreciate or the gifts that you see in the other people in your group. What do you see that makes them special? What do they contribute to this church and to the world? And if you happen to be in a group where you maybe don't know each other that well, another way to ask the question is what gifts do you see in yourself? What are things that you bring to the life of the church or to this world that make you special? Or even tell a story about a time when someone else has done that for you. So, we'll just take a few minutes, but get into groups, about four or five, and name some gifts in the people that you see around you. It's wonderful here to hear the stories and the affirmation continuing on. <clears throat> but I am going to call everybody back to focus. As we get ready to sing our closing song, There Are Many Gifts, I will just leave you with this, uh, with this thought, which is that you are a needed piece of the puzzle. The puzzle is not complete without you. You have something to share with this world, with this congregation, with the people around you that is valued and wanted and celebrated. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday school and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.